Over thousands of years, Inuit in the Arctic have lived in harmony with nature, hunting and harvesting following the seasons, living on the ice or land, depending on the time of year. Inuit inhabit a vast land in the Arctic, a place few newcomers are able to experience. For millennia, Inuit survival depended on an intimate knowledge of their world. But within the last half century, the Arctic environment has become less predictable. Like people around the world, Inuit have had to leave their homeland and gather with world leaders to help solve the greatest issue of our time, climate change. The Inuit Circumpolar Council, or ICC for short, has been attending the annual climate change meetings for decades. They are part of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or UNFCCC. Each year, a conference of the parties to this agreement, or COP, is held. COP 27 took place in November 2022 in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt. Today, Inuit reality has become a global reality. And therefore, in the Indigenous Corpus and in the work of the collective world here at the COP, we stand in full solidarity with those who are, like we have been for decades, directly affected by climate change. We have set forward uh, a mission to put the ones that are accountable, it's the biggest polluters out there, it's those countries that have pledged to reach their goals, their climate targets. We are here for this. This is the reason we are here in Egypt and why we have to continue the fight. I'm trying to show them my perspective, my what I see today in the North, especially during winter, compared to 20 years ago when it was much more easier to travel on ice to go hunting or camping. My goal here is to ensure the voices of Inuit and the Arctic are heard and push for stronger, faster measures to halt the devastating impacts of climate change in our Arctic and around the world. In addressing the issue of climate change and global warming, I want to say to the international community, the time has come to stop debating about climate change. It's time for the international community to take action. We'll return to COP27 in Egypt later, but first, let's take a look at what climate change is. Climate change refers to the long-term warming of the planet. It is largely caused by the burning of fossil fuels such as coal and oil. This releases greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. These gases trap heat from the sun, causing the Earth's temperature to rise, known as the greenhouse effect. As the Earth warms, we are seeing extreme weather events, such as heat waves, drought, hurricanes, and rising sea levels due to melting glaciers and ice caps in Greenland and Antarctica. The Arctic is warming four times faster than the rest of the planet. This is disrupting traditional hunting and fishing practices and causing coastal erosion. Climate change also has major impacts on ecosystems and biodiversity. As temperatures change, species move to find a more suitable habitat. To address climate change, we must reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and transition to clean renewable energy sources. The path for Inuit to get to the modern-day COP climate change meeting started over four decades ago. In 1977, ICC was founded by the late Eben Hobson of Utqiavik, Alaska, to unite Inuit from across Canada, Greenland, Alaska, and Chukotka in Russia. And we agreed that uh, we would sponsor the very first uh, Circumpolar Inupiat Conference in Barrow. ICC represents 180,000 Inuit. It is a respected international indigenous organization and is a trusted and compelling Arctic voice on global issues. Given its implications for Inuit cultural survival, ICC became engaged several decades ago on the issue of climate change at the international level. 
Many ICC declarations have pointed to the urgent need to deal with climate change for Inuit. The international process to tackle climate change began with the Earth Summit held in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil in 1992. Former ICC Chair Mary Simon attended the summit along with representatives from 179 countries. The Rio summit was a place where uh, governments and non-governmental organizations like the ICC and other organizations came together to talk about the importance of why the world community needed to, to work together to mitigate climate change. The main objective of the Earth Summit was to create a new blueprint for international action on environmental issues. So the Rio Summit was part of that process and uh, I was there as a delegate and it was a very important thing that we needed to do. One of the outcomes of the summit was Agenda 21, a program of action to achieve sustainable development in the 21st century. The Earth Summit also created the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. It is the UN Treaty that holds the annual Climate Change Conference of the Parties, or COPS. As the effects of climate change in the Arctic became more severe in the years following the Earth Summit, ICC took action to bring the issue to global attention. In December 2005, ICC supported a petition filed by Inuit with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights to draw attention to the effects of climate change caused by industrial activities in the USA. It was submitted by ICC Chair Sheila Watt-Cloutier along with 62 Inuit from Canada and Alaska. For us, it was about implanting ourselves as Inuit in the world in a more serious way of addressing this issue of climate change and really humanizing it. As we know, most people have come to understand climate change in political terms, in economic terms, in scientific terms. And it was important for us to really put it in terms of the human dimension and human rights, in fact, because Again, our livelihoods completely and our culture, our language, our teachings rely on the well-being of our climate. The petition drew on Inuit knowledge from hunters and elders. It documented the destruction of the Arctic environment as well as the hunting-based economy and culture of Inuit caused by global warming. It noted, climate change is amplified in the Arctic what is happening to us now will happen soon in the rest of the world. As the world is now learning, this statement turned out to be farsighted. The Commission granted a special hearing allowing ICC to present the case in March 2007. The petition succeeded in raising awareness of the issue at the global level from the Inuit perspective. It was important that the world heed and hear that signal from the top of the world because the Arctic's glaciers and, and the Arctic's ice are the cooling system for the planet. And that is breaking down. It has been for a long time now. And as that breaks down, it creates the erratic behaviors that we see today all around the world. The hurricanes, the intense hurricanes, tornadoes, the droughts, the fires, the floods. All of these are a result of the breakdown of that cooling system, the air conditioner, if you will which is the Arctic glaciers and ice. Another way ICC works to include Inuit perspectives and knowledge on climate change is at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, known as the IPCC. This is the UN body that assesses the science related to climate change. ICC was granted observer status in March 2021. We were the first indigenous organization to achieve this. Hundreds of scientists from around the world collaborate on the IPCC assessment reports. ICC is an expert reviewer and has contributed to chapters specifically regarding the Arctic regions. Former ICC Chair Dr. Daly Sambo Doro was one of the authors on the IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere. The work of the Inuit Circumpolar Council within the 
Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has been significant and it's important because not only is understanding Western science about climate change crucial for the Intergovernmental Panel, but significantly indigenous knowledge, the first-hand observations of our people and the knowledge that we hold about our communities needs to be factored in and considered as a, as a way of knowing about the impacts of climate change upon our people and our communities. The special report stated what Inuit have been saying for decades. Global warming has led to widespread shrinking of the cryosphere, with mass loss from glaciers, reduction in snow and Arctic sea ice and thickness and permafrost thaw. As Eben Hobson said decades ago, we have intricate knowledge that we've seen no others demonstrate. So we have to bring our voices and our representatives so that we can demonstrate that knowledge to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. There have been a number of key milestones in the battle to combat climate change. In 1997, the Kyoto Protocol was concluded and established legally binding obligations for developed countries to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions from 2008 to 2012. In 2015, the Paris Agreement was adopted at COP21. Its goal is to limit the rise in global temperatures to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels to avoid catastrophic effects of climate change. To achieve this goal, carbon dioxide emissions must be cut 50% by 2030. ICC was at COP21 in Paris. Ukalik Iritsiak was the ICC chair at the time and said in a press release, Inuit voices were heard in the negotiation rooms heard in the halls, in the plenary, in the side event rooms, and in the streets of Paris. We pushed for the inclusion of the rights of indigenous peoples, the value of indigenous peoples' knowledge, the need for adaptation and mitigation actions, and the need to work towards 1.5 degrees Celsius. This chart shows that achieving 1.5 degrees will be difficult, as CO2 emissions continue to increase despite the Paris Agreement. In fact, in the early part of the 2020s, the world witnessed catastrophic examples of extreme weather events. That sweltering heat isn't unique to the U.S. New highs set in Canada and Peru this week, and Beijing reported nine straight days of temperatures topping 95 degrees. In the Arctic, melting sea ice contributed to more frequent and severe storms. A Pacific typhoon pounded the western coast of Alaska. Homes were torn from their foundations. Pacific typhoon over the weekend. Authorities are currently assessing the destruction. In Greenland, the ice sheet is melting at an alarming rate, causing global sea levels to rise. In Nunavik, Canada, a massive mudslide occurred near the Hudson Bay coast. British Columbia went from raging forest fires, with one town being erased from the map, to devastating floods. During the summer of 2020, Europe experienced a heat wave with record temperatures, causing widespread drought and forest fires. With the severe heat wave hampering efforts to control the inferno. In Germany, the famous Rhine River is drying up, severely limiting transport barges. Record-breaking temperatures in Australia setting off massive forest fires, turning the day into night. In the months before COP27 took place, extreme flooding caused immense hardship in Pakistan. By the time the ICC delegation arrived at Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt in early November 2022, it was clear the effects of climate change were now a planetary emergency. ICC Canada President Lisa Hubekwaru was there to bring the Inuit message. Inuit Nunat, 
our circumpolar homeland is warming three to four times faster than other parts of the world. And climate change is happening not caused by our own region, our own people, but coming from exterior, from the exterior. Uh, and yet we are experiencing climate change uh, a lot more than those who are causing it. ICC developed a position paper for COP27. It included five recommendations. The first called on the world to take immediate action to address the inequity of climate change, respecting the Inuit inherent right of self-determination. The second focused on Inuit knowledge in global discussions. The third urged that engagement with Inuit be guided by ICC's circumpolar Inuit protocols for equitable ethical engagement. The fourth urged the global community to recognize that the Arctic environment plays a critical role in global temperature regulation. During a presentation, Bita Ignit, the delegation elder and Inuit cultural representative, spoke about this. When you consider where I come from, I was born in the Nikolu and lived in the Nikolu for the first 11 years of my life. And I learned how to do traditional weather forecasting from my father, who was born into a Stone Age uh, society. For most of his life, he did his weather forecasting because weather forecasting is an extremely important aspect of Inuit culture as a hunting society. He would look at the clouds in the sky and he would study the sky, the clouds, the formation of the clouds and the wind, where the wind was coming from. And so the next day, he would go out hunting when he knew that it was going to be a really nice weather tomorrow. And sure enough, tomorrow it's going to be a really nice day. So I would go out hunting with him, caribou hunting and seal hunting and things like that. Well, today, weather forecasting, traditional work forecasting is no longer accurate, unfortunately, because of the climate change and global warming. The fifth recommendation in ICC's position paper urged governments to recognize the false dichotomy between the developing and developed world. It's something that ICC Chair Sarah Olsvik spoke to during her time at COP27. Here at the COP, we are focusing on how to distribute money that is uh, being put into boxes of, of very strict and, and, and one-dimensional views of how the world is. It is. So we also come with the message of, of recognizing the false dichotomy of dividing the world into develop and developing. It is a hierarchical way of thinking that is not helping indigenous peoples to truly be recognized as equal to all other peoples. An ICC press release noted that COP27 was one step forward and two steps back. It says the conference was saved by a landmark agreement to establish a loss and damage fund that will see poor countries compensated for losses due to climate change. On the negative side, there are fewer references to indigenous peoples and human rights in the COP27 final agreement. On balance, ICC Chair Sarah Olsvig noted, our messages and recommendations were heard everywhere. Our delegates spoke on many platforms and interacted with many world leaders, other indigenous peoples and government delegations. ICC Canada President Lisa Hupikwale reflected that optimism and long-term approach. If we, if we don't achieve our goal now, achieve it in the near future, in the far future, for our children, for our grandchildren. That's what we are here for. Work on climate change continues. Planning is underway to bring the Inuit voice to future COP meetings. The complexity of climate change and the fact that it is affecting communities around the world means that no single country or region can tackle the problem alone. Inuit have known this for a long time. That's why ICC has been working at the international level.
Our message has been consistent. It is vital for all of us to work together to address this global challenge and find solutions to reduce our impact on the planet. Inuit have the will and knowledge to help turn things around. Human beings working together to meet the current challenges can create a more equitable and just world. Without the Inuit voice, the language of ice and snow could disappear forever. Today we stand on the shoulders of our former leadership and the work of the many, many Inuit experts and knowledge holders who have contributed throughout time. So much has been achieved by ICC and much is yet to be achieved. The global agenda is now focused on green transition, on loss and damage and equitable funding, and all of this must be based on our human rights. It is an utmost important task for us to inform the global community of what we consider climate justice to be. Our focus is on full and effective implementation of our rights in all processes. No efforts or initiatives should impair our inherent right of self-determination and no action should be taken in the name of a greater good if it violates Inuit rights. We will continue our strong advocacy and hard work on behalf of all Inuit. Thank <laughs> you.